Good morning. It's my distinct pleasure and incredible honor to welcome Professor Carol Emerson as our first panelist today. Professor Carol Emerson is the A. Watson Armour III University Professor Emeritus of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Princeton University. Her monumental corpus of work has focused on the Russian classics, especially Pushkin, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Mikhail Bakhtin, as well as Russian music, opera, and theater. I have been reading Carol's work ever since I was first inducted into the magnificent Bakhtinian world through a paper that I gave at the very first conference of my entire life, which was on the work of Bakhtin in Urbino, Italy, in the summer of 1989, where I shared a panel with Michael Holquist, who at that time was working on chronobiology. Ever since then, I've constantly looked to Carol's work and gleefully recommended it to my students who find her approach inspiring, inspired, thorough, and filled with the kinds of revelations and references that make this entire domain of work so provocative. Last semester, I taught a course at Vanderbilt on the work of Francois Rabelais in relation to the medieval carnival for which students also read Bertin's work, as well as the marvelous book, Aux Origines du Carnaval, Rabelais' Gargantua in French, as well as articles by Michael Holquist and, of course, by Carol Emerson. I taught in a classroom behind an elaborate plexiglass wall, wearing a mask, and the professor who taught the class after mine, arrived one day just in time to hear a bit of discussion that I was having with another student about Bartin. When the student left, this professor told me that this was, that Bartin's work was one of his principal preoccupations and he had done work with his, for his PhD with Professor Carol Emerson of Princeton University. We were able to gush enthusiastically about Carol, about her amazing work, and what an incredible inspiration that she has been for both of us. And I am so inspired to be with her here today. Good morning, Carol. My topic today is Bakhtin and masks. What does Bakhtin think that a mask can do? Masks are artificial, not organic. We can play with them, we can swap them. A mask is a persona, not a personality. So I will re-ask the questions that Robert Barsky just put to us. What is the primary function of a mask? To mimic, to conceal, to negate, to liberate? or to create. Since masks are played with, we might ask, are they compatible with ethical behavior? That is, with personal actions that add up and that we agree to answer for. These are questions that concerned Bakhtin a great deal, but we should know that Bakhtin personally used masks a lot. He borrowed from his older brother's CV to fake an undergraduate degree. He admitted to having given away drafts of his own books in the 1920s, which were then revised by his politically correct Marxist colleagues and published under their names. He gave away a lot, but he took plenty too. He inserted segments of other people's work with no attribution or credit into his own writing such as the description of the medieval grotesque body written by Ernst Cassier that appears in the book on Rabelais. Bakhtin was no fool, but he was fascinated by the masks of the rogue and the clown. 
Masks were crucial for Carnival, and Carnival was a state of society and a state of mind that Bakhtin adored throughout his life. In his introduction to his book on Rabelais, Bakhtin wrote, the mask is the most complex theme in folk culture, linked with the joy of change and reincarnation, with the cheerful negation of all uniformity and similarity. Parodies, caricatures, grimaces, eccentric postures, and comic gestures all grow out of the mask. But the mask is never just one object among other objects. That book on Rabelais was published in 1965. In 1940, Bakhtin had submitted a much longer and much smuttier version of this text as his doctoral dissertation. During its public defense in Moscow in November 1946, Bakhtin, who by then was 50 years old and an amputee, was given a hard time by some of his committee members. The hostile examiners pointed out that real life carnival was cruel and violent, that it scapegoated women and other minorities, that it was an undisciplined mob, in short, nothing to celebrate. Bakhtin, who was exhausted after the long defense, remarked at the end, as concerns carnival, I didn't have in mind carnival as something cheerful, not at all. In every carnival image, there's the presence of death. Speaking in your terms, carnival is a tragedy. Only tragedy doesn't have the final word. So what are we to make of this? In your terms, carnival is a tragedy. Who's the you? Bakhtin is addressing the examiners at his defense, certainly, but he's also addressing all of modern European culture. The reason that tragedy doesn't have the final word has to do with the way Bakhtin understood the ancient and medieval mask. Masks permit the spirit to survive when the body is tormented and needs a refuge. But for Bakhtin, more was at stake than escape or relief. Masks are stylizations, and in that sense, of course, they are fixed, but also they symbolize the ambivalence of every external gesture, the fusion in it of praise and blame, of affirmation and negation, this is Bakhtin's archaic grotesque, which uses the carnival mask to demonstrate that everything has more sides than we think, that nothing is ever entirely finalized. In the 1970s, Bakhtin often remarked that his very survival had been pure carnival, an undeserved piece of carnivalesque good fortune. So now to move to the two questions or two paradoxes that I raise in this talk. The first question. Mikhail Bakhtin is famous as a philosopher of the speaking face. What happens when you cover the face up? And the second question. Carnival and theater are both performance genres that rely on mask of the entracht, temporary masks sanctioned by ritual or by authority for a limited time. What about the masks of everyday life derived from them? The rogue, the clown, and the fool in Russian plut, shoot, durak. What are their rights and duties? So first, Bakhtin is a philosopher of the speaking face. And here we must begin with a familiar feud. The tension between those who love Bakhtin for his dialogism and those who love his carnival. Dialogue creates an identity. It entails speaking, answering, remembering. It also requires committing to one's own place in the world which Bakhtin called putting one's signature on events. 
This is the moral Bakhtin. In his early essays, Bakhtin insists that there is no alibi for existence, that each of us is radically singular in our relationship with every other person. And therefore to act morally means to do what only I can do in my own time and space. It would seem that carnival is the opposite. It's all about orifices, that is tunnels full of multiple bodies in transit, not about cumulative individual conscience. Under carnival conditions, Laughter, grunts, and curses are far more common than real conversations. Everything is ambivalent. Nothing has a history and no one has a memory. Everything is present tense. If a person dies, she's giving birth at the same time. If an insult is received, it is instantly returned and instantly forgotten. Since all options are present at once, there can be no normative ethics. This is the festive amoral Bakhtin. The differences will seem clear enough to us, but it's important to remember that Bakhtin himself saw no tension between the double-voiced word of carnival, uh, pardon me, of dialogue, and the double-bodied image of carnival. He considered both of them to be shapeshifters and both use masks. That is, both insert a protective layer on the border between inside and outside, which permits a person some privacy, playfulness, renegotiation of identity and symbolization. In fact, this play of inside versus outside is one of the two basic parameters or metrical constants in Bakhtin's universe. So to step back for a moment and consider these two basic parameters which he held to throughout his life. The first parameter is inside versus outside, inside myself or my body versus yourself, your body. And the truth to take home from this is I can never experience you as you experience yourself you can never experience me as I experience myself. The second parameter is open versus closed. Open or laughing, unfinished, mobile, what Bakhtin calls a personality versus closed, serious, completed, static, what he calls a thing. The information hub for these acts is the face and all human acts move between these two poles Either we treat the outside like a person or like a thing. Since the hub is the face, it can be monitored by a mask. So the next question, why have a face? Daniel McNeil's 1998 book, A Natural History of the Face, opens on this question. A face isn't strictly necessary, McNeil says, but it's surprisingly common in biology. A true face bundles mouth and sense organs, and it may be older than shell or bone. So why conceal it? Perhaps because the face is too responsive, too vulnerable, too nude. Masks help us. They can stylize a face, that is, heighten it, or they can conceal it. What is more, a ritual mask, which is on the border between a thing and a personality, can come alive, but only when used. All theater used to be masked, McNeil notes. Medieval mystery plays required masks, as did Commedia dell'arte, but as verisimilitude rose in popular esteem, cosmetics came to replace masks. By the time of Shakespeare, they were gone. Now enter Bakhtin, who was trained as a classicist. Bakhtin believed in the reality of masks, in their virtue as cultural commodities. He regretted their disappearance from the theatrical stage and rejoiced at their survival in Carnival. Human beings, he believed, have always been hungry to connect with the symbolic order, which masks always facilitate. About this anthropology, Bakhtin was quite explicit in the mid-1940s. 
at that time, he was trying to reconnect his major thoughts of the 1930s, and those were his theory of the novel and his ideas about Carnival, with some of his basic early philosophical ideas about inside, outside, and open, closed. He had submitted his dissertation on Rabelais in 1940, but before its defense in 1946, he was already planning to expand it to provide, amongst much else, a brief chronotopic account of the evolution of modern European drama, which included some provocative thoughts about Shakespearean tragedy. A portion of these notes have been translated and published as additions and changes to Rabelais. Bakhtin argues in these notes that for all European performance art, folk carnival is the primal energy source. Slowly, the tragic hero emerges out of the decay of ancient carnival, which was masked and always ambivalent. Masks remain for a while, but the meaning of the mask changes. It stabilizes. It begins to mean only one thing. Bakhtin planned to study this narrowing or degeneration of carnival wholeness in three phases, which were to be symbolized by Oedipus, Shakespeare, and Dostoevsky. The first phase is the Oedipus plays of Sophocles. Ancient Greek tragedy still displayed a trace of communal carnival in the masked chorus, which is far wiser and more powerful than any individual hero. The second phase in this degener degeneration of carnival is Shakespearean tragedy. Here the mask has been lost and we see the naked face of King Lear or Macbeth. These naked faced kings symbolize for Bakhtin the tragedy of individuation, the breaking out of a singular one way body that resents its own mortality. There is nothing at all fertile about these royal trajectories. Nothing is shared or passed on to a younger generation. All they know is power and terror. Properly played, the gestures are exaggerated, stylized, deep and violent. Up is heaven, down is hell, and in between only misery and confusion. Bakhtin calls these parameters topographical as they are modeled on mystery and miracle plays. For a century or two, French neoclassical drama preserves this stylized grandeur. But then, says Bakhtin, the stage takes a wrong turn. Theater becomes trivial and merely personal. His example here is Henrik Ibsen and everyday bourgeois drama. For Bakhtin, this is an awful development. Bourgeois drama mimics tragedy, but is really only domestic squabbling with feeble gestures and feeble personal fates. This enfeeblement has a parallel in the Rabelais book. There, if you remember, Bakhtin argues that over the last thousand years, laughter has gotten thinner and worse. Now he argues that dramatic art too has become flatter emptier, thinner, more cluttered and diluted with petty everyday detail. The example given by Bakhtin, who was a chain smoker, is the quivering of a hand opening a cigarette box. So the theater stage has forgotten how to do true tragedy and true life-affirming comedy. It has lost all philosophical height and depth. The values of height and depth move to the polyphonic novel, and specifically to the brothers Karamazov. So we have arrived at phase three. Now it's true that Dostoevsky and tragedy has no masks, but Bakhtin suggests, the great Dostoevsky novels manage to reproduce the grandeur and glory of the masked mystery plays. And Dostoevsky is careful to create as a backdrop to all his great novels, his own ambivalent chorus of carnival fools. It's a pity that Bakhtin didn't go beyond the realistic theater of Ibsen. 
His notes for the revision of his dissertation make no mention of modernist theater, of puppetry, of Meyerhold's biomechanics, of Stravinsky's Petrushka, or the rebirth of masked comedy on the 20th century stage. Bakhtin's emphasis is on one thing only, the catastrophe of individuation, of cutting an individual off from the whole. And the mistake of thinking that wholeness ever meant something singular, homogenized, static, and thus serious. Integrity for Bakhtin was always dynamic and ambivalent. If a thing is real, it's always changing. It's somehow twirling and in transit. If it's the face one moment, then it's got to be the buttocks the next. One passage from Bakhtin's notes graphically spells this out. To make an image serious means to remove its ambivalence and ambiguousness, its unresolvedness, its readiness to change its meaning, to turn itself inside out, its mystifying carnival essence. It means to stop the turning of cartwheels, its tumbling, to separate front from rear, to stop at the moment in which the face is up front, to separate praise from invective, to stop the spinning and the rises and falls, to place upright facing the audience. That last phrase, literally, pastavit na nagu itzonk publica, to place it firmly on its feet with its face to the public, that is, when we stop a twirling torso so that the eye is at the center and the face is in front, we make the image answerable to a single personality. And thus, we introduce death into life. Bakhtin, with his medieval and pre-modernist preferences, thirsts after immortal wholes the fitting of the human being into the symbolic order. Once we lose the chorus and once we lose the sense of the two-tiered and two-layered face, matters inevitably get serious and frightened. This is the reality of an unmasked mortal world. In his notes for the revision, Bakhtin suggests another way to conceive this history of the collapse of Carnival one that helps us to explain how Bakhtin could begin with a Greek tragedy, Oedipus the King, and end with something as different in genre and texture as the naked-faced novels of Dostoevsky. Bakhtin referred to this as the seriousification of the world. It's the story of our increased and increasing innerness, our increasing inability to share ourselves with others, or as the Marxist critic Georgi Lukács put it, it is the story of our move from epic to novel, and I might add here, from mask to face. What would be studied by this new history? It would investigate seriousness in its non-exploitative, unofficial forms not the official hierarchy that wields power and terror, but weakness, sadness, suffering, timidity, the seriousness of the slave and the seriousness of the victim. Only two dozen pages of notes are what we have of this unrealized project. And this is unfortunate, I think, because overall, the serious is a category that was very badly treated by Bakhtin he tends to simplify seriousness, to homogenize it, to fuse it with political power or with terror. Serious power and serious unlaughing official authority never seem to bring any goods or benefits. But in this seriousification project, Bakhtin does at least credit that there are some respectable human conditions that we cannot simply laugh away. What's interesting is how Bakhtin defends the emergence of this weak, timid, suffering, non-laughing reality and allows us to respect it. It requires that we unmask or collapse many potential faces into one, even though this process can only result in the individuation of the person, that person's potential monologization, 
and thus trivialization. This is the move from all that is external, twirling, tumbling, spinning, layered on the surface, to something we recognize as a core. In effect, it means getting from the Rablesian carnival mask to the suffering Dostoevskian face without losing topographical grandeur. Now, this was an outside to inside project of enormous seriousness, and it is the glory of the novel. The editors of Bakhtin's collected works painstakingly pulled together scraps of phrases from various of Bakhtin's notebooks and came up with this sequence in their commentary to the Rabelais book, the historical line, Rabelais, Shakespeare, Dostoevsky. The external person as part of the ancestral folk body in the external topographical coordinates of the world in Rabelais. This gives way to the discovery of individual life in the external world in Shakespeare. And this finally culminates in the discovery and justification of the inner person of the soul in the intensive coordinates of the deepest possible innerness in the novels of Dostoevsky. So here we have two external persons, one masked, Rabelais, one unmasked, Shakespeare, who give way at last to authentic, invisible, serious innerness in the soul. This is Dostoevsky. So that's my backstory. And I have to now move to my concluding comments, which come to rest on the title of this talk, Bakhtin's novelistic masks for the rogue, the clown, and the fool. The polyphonic novel picks up the masks that realistic theater had discarded. What might be worthy seriousness in an unmasked world? Pictured here is the great Russian actor Benjamin Zuskin as Lear's fool during that tiny wedge of time in Stalinist Russia when Jewish culture was tolerated, the United Front against fascism in the mid 1930s. So here's the problem. To be unmasked means to accept that your flesh is mortal. It means that your natural face is all you have. So is there a vehicle for ambivalent carnival energy in an unmasked world? a vehicle that could function in a world that had undergone seriousification, and furthermore, a world that practiced the inner experience of private reading. Bakhtin thought that there was, and it didn't have to be tied to cyclical seasons of carnival or Lent. It was embedded in novels. He discusses these vehicles in part six of his essay on the chronotope. Rogues, clowns, and fools, Bakhtin says, carry with them into literature the theatrical trappings of the public square and the mask of the public ritual. But, he hastens to add, a rogue is not a scoundrel or a crook. He is not ethically compromised. Just as Lear's fool, who was the king's official jester, is not foolish, and clowns are not trivial or amusing. In a word, everything they say and do cannot be understood in a direct or unmediated way, but must be grasped metaphorically. They cannot be taken literally. Their existence is a reflection of some other's mode of being, and even then not a direct reflection. They are life's maskers. Their being coincides with their role, and outside this role, they do not exist. So this bit about not existing outside your role, this is the fused to the face aspect of the mask. But readers of novels must push further. Because Bakhtin immediately qualifies this relation between persona and personality, between the artificial mask and the natural face. 
Essential to these three figures is a distinctive feature that is also a privilege, the right to be other in this world, the right not to make common cause with any single one of the existing categories that life makes available. None of these categories quite suits them. They see the underside and the falseness of every situation. Therefore, they can exploit any position they choose, but only as a mask. The rogue still has some ties that bind him to real life. The clown and the fool, however, are not of this world and therefore possess their own special rights and privileges. These figures are laughed at by others, but they laugh at themselves as well. Which is to say when these public square maskers enter the novel, they are transformed and they assume vital communicative functions. They must do so because novels have a problem that the older canonic genres, the epic, the lyric, the drama, didn't have. Novels must position their authors. They must justify their access to their material. Personal authorship is complicated by the need to have some substantive, uninvented mask that would have the capacity both to fix the position of the author vis-a-vis -vis the life he portrays, how and from what angle he, a participant in the novel, can see and expose all this private life, and to fix the author's position vis-a-vis -vis his readers, his public. The novelist stands in need of some formal and generic mask that could serve to define the position from which he views life as well as the position from which he makes that life public. He needs a person to serve as narrative who is in life, but not of it, life's perpetual spy and reflector. This mask cannot be invented. It needs to be recognized as authentic. The audience or readership must trust its eyes, ears, and mouth. It's believed, it's uninvented, but as Bakhtin develops the idea, this mask is not just another you or me. It is in some strange way, all powerful, capricious and invasive. What about this mask of the novelist? It has a lot of rights. It has the right to not be taken literally, not to be oneself. The right to live a life in the chronotope of the entr'acte, the chronotope of theatrical space the right to act life as a comedy and to treat others as actors, the right to rip off masks, the right to rage at others with a primeval, almost occultic rage, and finally, the right to betray to the public a personal life down to its most private and prurient little secrets. Thus, the person who wears the mask cannot be shocked at violence and cannot, as it were, take any of it personally. Now, there are some problems with this. The best work on Bakhtin over the past half decade has been on this question of Bakhtin and violence. In Carnival and Dialogue, is Bakhtin naive about violence? Why does nothing hurt in Bakhtin? Closely connected to violence is the question of justice. Apart from the most simplistic reflexes, like a punch for a punch, a curse for a curse, or a laugh for a laugh, there isn't much attention to justice in carnival conditions. In fact, of the four cardinal virtues, justice, temperance, prudence, and fortitude, it can fairly be said that only fortitude has any standing at all in carnival, and even that can be debated. Bakhtin's rather indifferent to the four cardinal virtues. What interests him are the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, how any of that is possible. Why is this so? Is it significant that dialogue and carnival both flourish without a normative ethics? I think these are good questions. The answers that Bakhtin offers are both bright and dark, both masked and naked, and they are just beginning to be studied. But we remember again that line quoted from the Chronotope essay that what novels need is a person who is in life but not of it, life's perpetual spy and reflector. 
That is, what's needed is a point of view that is asocial, outsiderly, rebellious, indifferent to the smooth running of things. Only the masks of a clown or a fool, says Bakhtin, can offer a flexible, impersonal, pain-free refuge for authorship. Because they represent the metamorphosis of a czar or a god transposed into the netherworld, into death. And now I think we can better understand the response of the weary and aging Bakhtin at his dissertation defense in 1946. I didn't have in mind carnival as something cheerful, not at all. In every carnival image, there's the presence of death. Speaking in your terms, carnival is a tragedy. Only tragedy doesn't have the final word. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, we are we were planning on having Martin Eisner respond. He was injected with a mask, the mask of uh, COVID, in the form of a vaccination. So it was it was the the invented version of the of COVID that has unfortunately um, um, made him feel as though he has COVID, but doesn't have it. So there's an interesting mask story there as well. So in the year of having Martin respond, I will um, perhaps offer a few comments that will that could also be turned into questions if you wish. And I invite the audience to also ask questions um, through our Q&A and I will transmit them uh, to Carol if that works for everybody. So please feel free to to convey to me your questions. Um, I was thinking as I was listening uh, to your amazing overview, both of uh, Bartin and, and of course of his life, um, about the ways in which Bartin was forced to wear a mask increasingly perhaps in his own Soviet society. I think much is made as we think of Bartin from 1895 to 1975 of the various transitions that he went through in his own society and how they demanded of him that he wear various kinds of masks, partly to protect himself from the, uh, from the Stalinist repression and so forth. So, uh, that, so that early move that you make in thinking about his, his own life uh, and his life in masks um, is, is my first question comment. The second would be one that has been raised so often in regards to Bertin's work, which is wearing the mask of somebody else's name, uh, as he of course did in regards to Voloshinov and Medvedev and others uh, who would perhaps sign or perhaps appropriate parts of his work. And there is a kind of, there is a, a, an, an unauthenticity or an authenticity about using somebody else's name like that. Um, but I know that this is still uh, something that is, is discussed and um, perhaps will never be resolved like so many other good things that you've been talking about today. Nothing being finalized. Um, I also was thinking about the, the, the strangeness of a mask being so fixed. The mask is very often carved or, or etched or s solid. Um, and in that sense, it is kind of finalized. Uh, the self in, in Bartin's world is always in the process of becoming, but strangely, the mask is fixed and unmoving. So it becomes a dialogue perhaps between the, the fixed mask and the, the, the self in the process of becoming for which the mask itself is a medium. The mask becomes a medium for that process. Uh, so it's a, it's a strange uh, and a strange moment, I think, as I was thinking about that in regards to what you were saying. And I, when you said, when you spoke of the vulnerability of the face today, um, it's never meant as much as it has meant in the last year to have a vulnerable face uh, and to wear, to wear masks. Um, but also the, we've been judged on the basis of our vulnerable faces. We think 
quite differently about the experience of the self uh, versus the other's experience of the self as we walk around in our masks and as we seek expressions and as we seek um, <laughs> people's emotions through their face and, and, the, their, and people's connection to uh, what you described as symbolic order. So truly um, a, a strange and interesting moment here. Um, I think you also raised for me questions, again, that have been raging in the Bakhtinian world for so long in regards to monologism and dialogism uh, in the novel. It seems as though the novel could also be a kind of mask for the novelist who is able to say things or experience characters through literature that would otherwise be perhaps condemnable or inappropriate or impossible in the way that dreams can uh, do that. So that fascinating way in which uh, the novel can serve as another voice uh, in the world connected, but also not connected to the novelist means that perhaps this monologism, dialogism, schism is in some ways false. Um, because we're, we are in fact charged, I think, uh, in the way that you've described it in the modern Dostoevskian world with determining the, the, the dialogism beneath the monologism. So there's much more of a dialogue than I'd ever thought of until um, your own uh, description here. Um, and then finally, uh, when, when I, I, I mentioned that very first conference in 1989, it led to the, uh, the issue that we did, uh, Michael Holquist and I, on Bartin and otherness. And it strikes me now as strange that when we were trying to figure out what kind of a cover to put on that book, <laughs> on that, on that Disco Social Journal, we chose Bartin's death mask. Like what a, what a, what a crazy and strange choice. Um, Bartin had finally uh, come into himself in the form of this fixed image. But uh, I'm, I'm now uh, thinking about how poor the reproduction was that we had. It almost seems transparent. It's not a, it's not a very fixed mask. So as we, as we read through the various um, contributions in that collection, we, I, I, th I think of them in fact in a much more dialogic way in light of this almost transparent mask that represents uh, the Bakhtin that we're left with. And, and the Bakhtin that we're left with, you've described in, in such complex and fascinating terms. So there are a few questions in there, observations for you to maybe fly off as I await um, other questions from our, from our audience. I can respond briefly to that, Robert. It's uh, an excellent and difficult situation, Bakhtin and his fakery. He fakes his brother's events, makes them his own events. He, um, as it were, gives his books away, therefore faking authorship of something that he wouldn't really sign his name to. I think what Bakhtin would say to that is we don't own events. Uh, but we can use them if we're lucky and if others are willing to share and everybody he took from it knew about it was willing to share. He also didn't believe your own ideas and you didn't build a CV out of just saying I had this idea it's my property so pay me a royalty for it. This was not <laughs> Pakhtin's way and uh, when he gave his book drafts away to Medvedev and Valoshinov he knew they would be developed in a different way. He couldn't publish himself. Bakhtin was a neo-Kantian, an idealist, and a religious believer, although he felt these were all compatible with Marxism, as did many Marxists in the 1920s. He did not think he could be published, but he wanted his ideas to live. Depends mm. where you put life, Robert. You got to put life in the idea and in the survival of the idea. He simply had no authorial vanity. Now, if you think that's irresponsible, let me take it one step further. In his early manuscripts, when he talks about there being no alibi for existence, that we have to sign our events. Well, what he means by that, again, it's not a signature that brings you a royalty. What he means by that is you acknowledge that it exists. That's all you have to do. You simply say, this happened, and I'm going to take responsibility for it because that's my reality. It doesn't mean I caused it. it. doesn't mean I caused it. And this is why in Stalinist Russia, for instance, when he had a world literature department in some provincial teaching college, which he did for 15 years, 
when he opened his lectures, he had to give all sorts of praise to the great Stalin. You couldn't hold your position without doing that. Mm -hmm. And the collected works editors had to decide whether to include those prefaces in his collected works. They were authored works. And they decided very wisely, I think, that Bakhtin praising Stalin was not necessary to put in there because there wasn't a real addressee. There also wasn't a real speaker. Bakhtin knew it wasn't understood or cared for by anybody who heard it. He knew that he was not free not to say it. And therefore the word simply meant something else. That is the entire preface was a mask. Mm. And this was a mask that didn't have to be fused to his face. So all I can say is that this idea of somehow shifting and softening the rigid dichotomy between the monologue and dialogue, monologism and dialogism, responsibility and carnival is long overdue. It depends on what you want to survive. Bakhtin was a believer, he didn't think you died, but he did believe that it was quite possible to be silenced, seriously silenced in the body, and that one should work very hard keeping the most important parts of oneself and the others that one respects and loves alive. Beautiful. Professor Emerson, I have a question from uh, an attendee. Uh, it's just anonymous here, so I don't know who it is, but um, it says, could you say something about the relationship between the mask and then in brackets wearing and masquerade from Bartin's perspective? Oh, that's wonderful. I think for masquerade, he understood it in a sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century sense, and of course it changes in Europe, but it was an official dance. It was something that for him wasn't nearly as vital and important as a carnival mask. The problem with masquerade, and again, there's famous Russian literary works, one by Mikhail Lermontov that used these words, and he had this in mind. Masquerade was something that high society does what he really loved, you know, was Mexican carnival. What he loved was the possibility to take a mask, put it at a distance from your face in a way that was much more fearless than anything that Romeo did trying to court Juliet. It was really fearless because you're dealing with death every minute, not just with exile, but every minute death. And you're licking popsicles that have skeletons in them. I mean, you're doing what Eisenstein loved to do with Mexican carnival when he filmed it. It's absolutely accepting death and life as part of the same twirling torso. So I think he believed that masquerade was a slightly artificial type of carnival, but Bakhtin was a very grateful person. He didn't hold grudges. He had a certain carnival generosity to him that's quite marvelous. And he believed that a mask wearer had a certain responsibility to live up to the potential of the medieval and pre-modern mask. And what that was primarily was not faking it. It wasn't stealing something. It wasn't pretending to be what you weren't. It was simply integrating your mortality into some larger cycle. And modernism is not good at that. We fear death. And what the carnival book's about, forget that Rabelais wouldn't have understood it. <laughs> If he read about himself in it, there's nothing much about Rabelais in it, but there's an awful lot about what Rabelais cared about. And here what's key, I think, is that the book's written to help Russians not fear death. They died in huge numbers in the 30s and 40s. Bakhtin didn't know why in the world he didn't die himself. God knows his body was on the way out several times and he was chronically ill since the age of nine. So you got a person here who's been faithful to his idea that if you look at the body as a conduit, a conduit, yourself and other, this life, some other life, this life and no life, but a conduit to some other state, you look to the body as doing that, then the mask wearer can stylize that precious event. Stylize that event. Don't stylize the death mask. That ought to be transparent. That's just a fused mask, a mask that's fused to the mortal body. That's not necessary to live by. You need to live by something stronger and more uh, more potent than that. Wow, more potent, more powerful, more eternal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah, leaving leaving behind ideas and leaving behind images of the self. All, all, all out the door, all out the door, Robert. 
fascinating. <laughs> we have another question. I hope it's okay that I say it's from Elliot Shrimpton. Uh, could Carol say something about Bartin's literal masks, the physical mask objects? Are there photographs or records of the designs, the origins, the makers, and so forth that he worked with or that he owned? So the actual masks, yeah, only we knew. Yeah, that's wonderful. I do not yeah. know that question. It's quite possible an archivist in Russia does. Bakhtin had very little personal belongings. He didn't have his own books. He was shuttled all over the continent, really. And my feeling is that although he was quite a good connoisseur of theatrical and visual art, didn't care much for most drama. <laughs> Books were sent to him. So I really don't know what his personal effects are. Unlike so many famous people, he doesn't really have an archive, a memorial museum. So he has a couple of cardboard boxes with manuscripts that people spent 20 years basically pulling out of a woodshed in Saransk. He wasn't a man who believed much in anything material except the next cigarette, which was of absolute importance to him at all times. He was a painkiller for Bakhtin as well as the tea he drank. I see. He was not a man who could get the aspirin he needed to keep his body from hurting. Mm. He would have loved, I think, to have worn a mask that saved him, but the only time you really hear Bakhtin rejoicing is after his leg is amputated in 1938 and finally his health improved enough to hold a permanent job and he said with crutches i can now actually move around without pain and he felt it was a deliverance you're speaking about a very brave person physically here and i don't think that much of what he actually contained in his personal archive or museum is curatable really only words are curatable for Bakhtin. Hmm. And even the words are subject to the contents, the context in which they're spoken for him. Absolutely. So that's a, a constant ethereal self. Well, I don't see other questions except the question that I too have, which is, will this be recorded and kept for posterity? I certainly hope so. Uh, I know it's a terribly unbactinian thing to say, but I do wish that, uh, that your words were able to emanate beyond this, uh, this space. So it, it, it only remains for me to, to in an open-ended fashion, to thank you, Carol. Extraordinary. Well, thank you very much for listening to this and the rest of the conference will proceed in its spirit. Love it. Thank you, Carol.